Welcome and thank you for joining us for Community Perspectives on Justice and the Chauvin Murder Trial. My name is Sarah Davis and I'm honored to serve as the Executive Director of the Legal Rights Center. We are thrilled to have so many people joining us today for this critical community conversation on justice in the context of this trial. I know that many of you are familiar with the Legal Rights Center, but we also have folks joining us today from all over the country. So let me just take a moment to tell you about the LRC and why we are hosting this event. The Legal Rights Center is a community nonprofit law firm in Minneapolis founded in 1970. The LRC was born in a similar moment to the one in which we are currently living following the civil rights movement and the birth of the American Indian movement in the late 1960s. Through the coordinated efforts of members of Black and American Indian activist communities, the LRC was founded as a community law firm. Our founders later welcomed immigrant communities to their coalition, and LRC continues to be led and operated as a community-driven organization. Whether we are representing community members charged with a criminal offense, facilitating restorative family group conferences or circles, presenting Know Your Rights trainings, or advocating for system and policy changes, everything that we do is driven by our communities. It is our mission to work with our communities to seek justice and promote racial equity for those to whom it has been historically denied. Today's forum <clears throat> is part of our work focused on being rep responsive to community legal needs. With Derek Chauvin's trial for the murder of George Floyd set to begin on March 8th, we know that there is a critical need for accurate and accessible information about this trial from a trusted source. It is also deeply important to amplify the community's perspective on justice as part of the local, national, and international narrative in this case. To that end, today's forum is the first in a series of events that LRC will host. Towards the end of the forum, I'll come back and share more about these future events and how you can get involved. But for now, it is my honor to introduce you to our panelists for today's forum. Nakima Levy Armstrong is a civil rights attorney, activist, national expert on racial justice, former law professor and legal scholar. Nakima is the executive director of the Wayfinder Foundation, which provides support for women of color activists and organizers around the country. She is also the founder of the Racial Justice Network, a grassroots organization that organizes and leads protests and demonstrations, provides community outreach and resources, and challenges injustices within systems that impact Black people and other people of color in Minneapolis and the Twin Cities. I personally have had the distinct honor of working with Nakima on issues of racial equity in the justice system in Minnesota for several years, and I'm deeply grateful to have her with us here today. Kevin Reese is the founder of Until We Are All Free and the director of criminal justice at Voices for Racial Justice. He grew up in Minneapolis and was incarcerated for 14 years. He is a key leader in the Twin Cities community, serving and utilizing his platform to make effective change. After his encounter with the judicial system, his eyes were open to the inadequacies and injustice that permeate the system. As a result, his life's mission is to rectify the detrimental effects of mass incarceration. He is a 2018 AWP Intro Journals Project Award winner for poetry published in the Hayden Ferry Review. And Kevin is a critical partner of ours at the Legal Rights Center, and we are incredibly grateful to have him join us here today. Mary Moriarty is the former Chief Hennepin County Public Defender, a role she served in for six years. She was also a core faculty member of Gideon's Promise for 15 years and the 2015 recipient of the Stephen B. Bright Award. She is on the Faculty of Public Defender Trial Skills programs across the country, teaches at Harvard Law School Trial Advocacy Workshop and the National Criminal Defense College, and runs the Criminal Defense Clinic here at the University of Minnesota Law School. She is also a frequent contributor, contributor of webinars and blog posts for the National Association for Public Defense. She is a powerful courtroom advocate and somebody that I have been incredibly fortunate to collaborate with on issues of justice. We're very grateful to have Mary joining us here today. And finally, our forum today will be moderated by Andrew Gordon, LRC's Deputy Director for Criminal Legal, Community Legal Services. Andrew was born and raised in Kingston, Jamaica. While Andrew was in college, his cousin had a number of interactions with the police that ultimately led to his imprisonment for 10 years. That experience with the criminal legal system led Andrew to law school and to a career focused on representing those like his cousin who were disempowered and marginalized by a legal system designed to work against them. Andrew has dedicated his career to advocating for and empowering communities of color, immigrant communities, and other marginalized communities. 
He understands that there is nothing that separates him from the plight of his clients and their families. We are deeply honored to have Andrew on our team at LRC and to have him moderate today's forum. With that, Andrew, I'll turn it over to you. Hey, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, Sarah, for the introductions. Uh, thank you to our panelists all for joining us. To all you folks attending, uh, thank you for being here. Um, for those of you in Minnesota, it's warming up. I know the inclination is to get outside at this point, but we're here today to have this conversation, to create this space for this conversation, and, and to talk a little bit about what it means for there to be justice in the wake of continued law enforcement malfeasance and brutalization of black and brown bodies. Um, the upcoming trial of Derek Chauvin for the murder of George Floyd is just around the corner. And there is space now at this particular moment in time to talk about what it means for justice to exist in the context of historical and continuing trauma in the Twin Cities and throughout the United States. Uh, when it comes to the interaction of police officers, when it comes to that interaction with individuals who are not white. Um, there's an ultimate question here, right? Is it enough to hold a single officer or four or five officers accountable for what most of us understand and know to be systemic failings? Um, and systemic failings in the sense that a lot of us believe that the criminal legal system is working as intended, that it is designed to marginalize those of us who are non-white, those of us who come from a different background than the individuals it benefits. To that end, I want to turn the attention to the folks who are gathered here, to Kevin, to Nakima, to Mary, um, because I know that you're here to see and to hear from them. Uh, and I have a number of questions and prompts for them that are hopefully will guide this particular conversation. Uh, my role to, is to moderate that conversation, uh, to keep everyone on time, to get everyone out of here by 5.30, that's my plan, uh, and to make sure that when I get questions from you attendees, um, that we are being able to weave those questions into this forum such that you can participate as well. Um, please, if you have questions, leave them in the chat. My understanding is that you should have access to the chat. Uh, I will see them. Uh, Sarah, who you just heard from, will also be looking at them. Um, and you send those questions, we will weave them into our, our program here. And we will, I am, my plan is at this point is to dedicate a, a portion of today's uh, agenda specifically to your questions and we'll get to those. Now that being said, and without further ado, I want to turn to the panel with kind of the first question of the day, the first prompt. Um, in many people's opinion, the goal of the legal system is to achieve justice for victims and the community when a crime is alleged to have occurred. I want to start broadly and I want to kind of think big picture about this. Um, but what really does justice mean when we start thinking about having people go through the criminal legal system, having defendants be prosecuted, potentially convicted, or maybe not convicted. Um, um, I'm gonna start with you, Mary, because you're the other attorney on the panel. Uh, well, <laughs> I can say that. I'm doing a major disfavor, disservice to uh, Nikki Levy Armstrong, who is a fantastic attorney and I've had a chance to work with her. Um, so I apologize for that. In fact, Nikki, I'm gonna, I'm gonna fix that apology. I'm gonna start with you on this one. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. I mean, right, brother, I'm an activist as well. So sometimes people forget that I'm also a lawyer. Mm -hmm. But um, I think that it's very challenging in terms of thinking about what justice means in the context of a criminal justice system that has been built upon the backs of Black people, um, other folks who have been marginalized, and those that we deem as undesirables in our society. And all of this happens for the benefit of those who have the resources to um, continue to you know, build these prisons, um, hire police officers, correctional officers, and not to mention the corporations that benefit off of inmate labor. So it is very, very difficult. Even you know, when we're thinking about a, a system that is calling itself the criminal justice system to take that seriously in light of all of the atrocities that have occurred. And, and Kevin, I, I don't know if you wanna follow up with where Nakima kind of ended there, right? Um, yeah, um, for sure. When I think of justice, you know, that system was never 
designed for white bodies. That system was not designed for like white man to go into that place. So I don't see the, the penal system is something that will be justice for George Floyd and his family and for all of us. So what about Emmett Till, you know, Philando Castile, Jamar Clark, all of the precedent that happened before George Floyd that, you know, gave this officer permission to think that he can take his black body like that. You know, our history of all of the blood that we've seen lost. So I'm with Nakeem, it's really challenging when we're thinking about justice, when we're talking about a criminal justice system, because the truth is the actual criminal justice system is a system of criminals. The system itself is criminal. So how do we seek justice from an inhumane institution? That's what we're here to figure out, but I don't see that system, you know, serving as an end all to be all to some white male body. It won't. No, I, I hear exactly what you're saying, Kevin. In fact, you said something that I want Mary to comment on real quick, because you talked about the system giving permission to the officers in this case and to officers kind of kind of writ large. And Mary, I would love your thoughts on that with respect to notions of justice. Mm -hmm. Um. Yes, uh, I, I've been a public defender for 31 years and I don't look at this as a system of justice at all because it's born of enslavement, black codes, uh, Jim Crow, mass incarceration and our racial disparities are through the roof. And so I, I don't look at this as a system, um, as a just system. There may be individual results, which people are happy with, but as a system filled with systemic racism, we have a long way to go. Um, one thing I would say um, about what Kevin said there, and, and, and actually, Andrew, you brought this up too, will it, will it be enough if Chauvin and the other cops are convicted? And my answer to that is no. No, because that will not prevent this from happening again. And it does not bring George Floyd back to life. Um, so whatever you think of justice, you know, a conviction is not going to bring him back to life for his family, and it is not going to deter or prevent this from happening again. For that to happen, we need complete system reform. And it's not just about the police. Um, sometimes people ask me, how did the MPD get to be this way? And my answer is, um, there has never been any accountability in this system, not accountability from prosecutors who've seen this on body cam and video, um, not a lot of accountability from judges. And so we as a system have allowed this to happen. And the only way we can correct it is if the entire system, if we can all look at ourselves and say, what do we need to do differently? How do we hold us as a system accountable? And I think, I think that's a valid jumping off point for me to jump to kind of one of the questions that I prepared for, I think a little bit later in our discussion. Um, but since George Floyd's murder, we have learned a little bit about Derek Chauvin's past and his history of, you know, quote unquote, interacting with other black and brown bodies, right? Where he has done similar things to other people who were lucky enough to escape death. Um, Kevin, I, I want to bounce this, I guess, to you, but how do we square notions of justice with a system that seemingly continues or rewarded the, the type of behavior that we saw leading to the murder of George Floyd? We know it happened in the past. We, we, we can assume that other officers are doing similar things now and still. And so how do we square those notions with kind of questions of justice and questions of accountability? Um, we kind of don't, this system, there's no pathway through that system to, you know, to what we're talking about. This system is not the way there, um, first and foremost. I, I think that we need to rewrite the constitution. We need to split all the money and rewrite the constitution and come to the table as uh, having equal resources. As, and until we do that, America is gonna always see my brown body as its property. So, you know, these instances with, with, with Chauvin, this is just, you know, this is American. It was very American of him. Actually, he was doing what his founding fathers, you know, put him on this country to do. He was probably, this, he knows nothing else. And that's been the experience with me. And so many, that's my experience growing up a black man in America that you know that when they send you to jail, they literally sentence you to the custody of the commissioner. You are state property, right? And to be in this modern world and to look at your name and next to it for it to say state property, 
um, there's still so many people that see us as objects and not for a human being. So whatever we're looking for, if we're looking for this system to continue to fix it, it won't happen. It won't happen. We're steady trying to amend, amend, amend. But this seed is growing what this tree is. It is what it is. Um, we're going to have to do something radically different um, in order for us to get there. And if, you know, if I can jump in just to, to Kevin's point in terms of thinking about the way that the system is structured, as you all were saying before, this is by design. There are times when we've tried to push for reforms within the system, transformation within the system, and we get a lot of pushback from the people who work within the system and even uh, folks at the legislature as well who do not want to hear a different side to the story than their own experience as white residents of Minnesota. And I would argue that that sentimentality is spread all across the United States when it comes to uh, white middle-class mainstream people who typically have a very cordial relationship with law enforcement and who tend to ignore and neglect the concerns of black people and other people of color about the inhumane treatment that we too often receive at the hands of law enforcement. Beyond that, government is very much involved in what happens to black people. Um, the fact that we would have laws written that allow police officers to kill with impunity. Uh, all they need to say nowadays is that they feared for their safety. That's the only reason we didn't hear that in this case was because um, George Floyd was down on the ground, you know, uh, being subdued by Derek Chauvin and the other three officers. So he couldn't use that defense. But that's what we hear time and time again, whether somebody has a cell phone, whether they're going to their car to get their kids, whether they're walking down the street, I feared for my safety. So what does that say about our society that we allow such a low threshold for lives to be taken? And what does it also say about our system of justice, if you will, that we allow a group of people, sometimes with very limited education, a lack of cultural competency to have this amount of power and authority that goes unchecked. That is why um, George Floyd was killed along with so many other people who died before him and who will continue to die at the hands of law enforcement because our system has sanctioned this kind of behavior. Can I jump in? Um, it made me think of, uh, I, I sort of invited myself to go to the implicit bias training that MPD had several years ago. Sorry. <laughs> and um, it was really good. It was me and 20 cops. And there was a lieutenant there um, who from the very beginning made it clear he did not want to be there and it was a waste of his time. But one of the things I walked away remembering was that they were asked what their goals were for the upcoming year. And this lieutenant stood up and he said, I want to maintain the warrior mentality because that's why I became a cop. And I walked away from there thinking, this is gonna take a long time for this culture change because this guy supervises other people. Um, and he became a cop as some other cops did because actually as a nation, we asked them to. They were the people who were going to um, be in the war on drugs, right? Um, and so we have allowed them, we've asked them, we've looked the other way when they have behaved the way they have. And there are still cops on that force that believe that. And until we can get rid of them and change that culture, it's going to be a problem. I'll say like, as Nakima said, I mean, our clients at the public defender's office, I've been a public defender for 31 years and they would tell us this is happening the same way that, you know, Nakima and Kevin do, but nobody believed them or us, it was really the advent of video um, that allowed us to see what was happening. But even then, you can sometimes show a video to a prosecutor and say, look at this behavior. Why is the cop, why does the cop have his knee in this person's back? And the prosecutor shrugged their shoulders and, and um, instead look at, well, I think I've got, I can prove this case. So there's never been any accountability you know, picking up the phone and calling the police chiefs and saying, hey, um, this, co this cop is interacting with people in our community in an inappropriate way. And we have a problem with that. We're not gonna charge his cases. Um, you need to do something about that. Because I think people think there's somebody out there watching all the body cam video and there isn't. 
So when it comes to the attention of prosecutors and judges, they need to step up and do something about it. That's one way of holding cops accountable that hasn't happened in the past. And, and so let me kind of put what seems to be a pretty simple question to the panel and whoever wants to kind of jump with an answer first can feel free to do so. But would a conviction in the Chauvin trial be justice? Right? It's a fairly simple question that I imagine is going to lead to some very interesting answers. Um, Nakima, you, you look like you're ready to jump in. So can I, Andrew, uh, there's a question from the, from the attendees that, that really dovetails well with this, which is that, you know, as it relates to this trial, is there anything that, um, you know, whether there's a conviction or otherwise, are there things that we could see come out of this trial that can help, um, the public be satisfied and to help build trust? So I'll just put that out to the panel as part of that question. I don't think that a conviction in this case should lead to satisfaction with the system because it reinforces this notion of, oh, this was just one bad apple and possibly three others who helped kill George Floyd. But as we say in the streets, the whole damn system is guilty as hell. And we see that time and time again, all of the supervisors and um, inspectors and sergeants and whomever had oversight over Derek Chauvin and other cops who still are on the force at MPD and look the other way as Chauvin was engaging in brutality against black and brown bodies over the years and being um, willing to ignore those complaints and to fail to discipline Derek Chauvin. And meanwhile, he's collecting a salary, he's collecting a pension. He's able to provide for his family on the backs of taxpayers of Minneapolis and the black and brown bodies that he was allowed to, to terrorize over the years. And the reality is that he's not the only one. There are still many, many cops who are um, on the force at MPD who have a similar history as Derek Chauvin, as far as abusing black bodies, criminalizing black people for very petty offenses and even killing people and still being allowed to keep their jobs. So no, this, this particular outcome of a conviction in this case will not bring total justice, but it will bring a semblance of justice in the sense of the courts finally recognizing that the lives of black people matter in the state of Minnesota. The overwhelming majority of officers who have killed people have been white men, and yet we have not seen a single white male officer held accountable for killing a black person in the state of Minnesota. So this would send a signal that the courts are finally beginning to pay attention to the value of our lives Although we know that again, the knee was a weapon as opposed to what we normally see, which is a gun and an excuse, as I mentioned before, that officers feared for their safety. So we have to understand this is an anomaly, the entire way that we look at the circumstances and a conviction very well might be an anomaly as well. I don't know if Kevin or Mary, if you've had anything you wanted to follow up with. Yeah, I, I was going to say from the beginning, you know, I, I think about public defender clients and unfortunately a majority of them are black and brown. And I think what people in our community see um, is two different systems. In other words, if it was a public defender client, he would have been charged right away. Um, and then the investigation would have continued after that. He would have been in jail. And we don't see that. And I'm not arguing that there should be a rush to charge somebody um, the way it happens with public defender clients. But what I'm saying is that this community has seen two different standards. And even when you go back to how Derek Chauvin ended up getting charged, you can see that different standard. I, when I think about what happened um, after this, I think of it as our Ferguson. In other words, it wasn't just about what happened to George Floyd. It was everything that's led up to that. Um, everything that Nakima and Kevin and other activists have been protesting and telling us. And, and I want to emphasize, it is not just this terribly egregious, horrific behavior. It's the everyday disrespect. I'm just going to give you a quick example. I was looking at a body cam video um, and it was a black, young black man charged with an obstruction. He was sitting in the back of the squad car, two white cops. He's arrested. They're driving him uh, to the police 
uh, jail. And apparently his dad showed up at the scene. And one of the white cops says to him, boy, your dad seems like a nice guy. You're just a dumbass, though. And, and then the cops start talking to the client about, you know, you really, really need to read your history books. You're not really that familiar with slavery. And, you know, it was just gratuitous. And, and the gratuitous uh, behavior, um, the things that are said uh, to black and brown people and what happens to them that doesn't nearly rise to the level um, of what we saw with George Floyd is an everyday occurrence. And until we get to the point where there's accountability for that, um, we're, we're not going to be where we need to be. And this, if it is a conviction, would be one step in the right direction, but not nearly as far as we need to be. What I would say is no, it won't be enough. You know, George Floyd family had to give his life to the soul of this country. We've lost too many people's lives to the soul of this country. You're right, they didn't even charge him right away. So all of the advocating that we did between when it happened and them being charged, it's trauma. The fact that we was having to say, like if I was like standing out there, we'd have been charged. So like, this is something that we know um, versus like these false ideals of what this country should be versus like the true brutal reality of what this country is. And what we've seen was the true brutal reality of what this country is. And that's what happened with brother George with Officer Chauvin taking his life like that in front of the world. Um, so no, that won't be enough. You know, just sending one white man to prison because they made me try to tokenize him. Look, we did one, we did this and it was horrific. It took all of that them to take brother George's life in front of the world in order for that to happen. So don't, set this to be precedent where, oh, let's not be hasty to charge another white man um, with murder. So no, I don't think that it will bring a sense of justice, not for me, not at all when we lost brother George's life to the soul of this country, when I've lost so many people that I love already to this country, we've lost enough. Just jumping in to say that there's questions from the audience really about what, if anything, um, you all think could be a measure of justice coming out of this trial. And, and really lead towards some of the change that you're talking about. Hennepin County got to look different. We need to be a complete overhaul of, of Hennepin County, what's happening, what's happened down there in Hennepin County. We have people, there are bad people who are serving in positions where they get to come and take our bodies out of our communities, right? Take our souls, kill us, send us to prison, like innocently, like we, it's evidence of what's happening here in Hennepin County. And I'm, a, I'm from Minneapolis. I've been here my whole life and I'm scared. My son drive around Minneapolis every day. So um, it has to be a complete overall overhaul, I mean, of the way we doing business in Minneapolis and Hennepin County right now, because what's happening right now is it's, it's criminal. None of us are safe. I agree with Kevin. And I don't think that there's even any intention of changing what's happening within this system. If that were the case, what we would see would be the uh, Minneapolis City Attorney's Office as well as the Hennepin County Attorney's Office doing a thorough review of every single case that Chauvin and those officers have been involved in, along with other killer cops on the force and cops who are known to uh, lie uh, on their arrestee reports and official reports that they have to submit. There's no probe <laughs> you know, looking into these individuals. We are merely comfortable, unfortunately, with all the folks who have been brought into the justice system who are serving time or who have served time at the behest of crooked cops. So if we were serious about transforming this system, those are some of the things that we would be looking at. Instead, the word of a police officer is still being trusted far and above the word of the average civilian um, who lodges a complaint or who raises concern about um, officer misconduct and behavior. And that may even be the case with body camera uh, footage now being available. We're still seeing a lack of discipline of many of those officers involved in um, a variety of incidences out in the community. Um, beyond that, you know, I know that um, there's been a lot of talk in the news about uh, Minneapolis police losing hundreds of officers um, to retirement or to PTSD. And you know, now, and I think honestly. It is a good thing that many officers have left the force because as one of our elders, Rosemary Nevels, said in the community, all those officers need to reapply for their positions. 
we know that the root of MPD, unfortunately, has been corrupt for far too long. They've engaged in far too much violence and abuse. Their misconduct has been rubber stamped by City Hall, where city council members have settled tens of millions of dollars in lawsuits over the years as a result of excessive force complaints. So there are too many cops who don't even need to be MPD officers. They need to go back to the suburban communities in which they live and apply to be police officers there. And if we are going to have a police force in Minneapolis, then there needs to be folks who look like us and who um, actually live in the community and who have a track record of community engagement and treating people with dignity and respect. And if any of those officers step out of line, there needs to be swift accountability or removal from the force. I was gonna say, I think the trial could be the beginning of accountability, but accountability has to come from a number of places. It's not just MPD. I mean, we have what, over 36 jurisdictions in Hennepin County alone. There are other police forces out there too with officers that do inappropriate things. It is a system. Um, nobody got this way by themselves. And so the whole system has to step up and be accountable. Um, that means uh, prosecutors' offices have to step up. And, you know, Nikima, you mentioned police officers who don't tell the truth. We have examples of police officers who are found uh, to have not been credible by judges, yet prosecutors um, in the county attorney's office continue to call them as witnesses. So that's what I mean by it's not just MPD, it's not just police officers, it is the entire system that needs to be accountable and we all need to step up and play a role in dismantling what we've allowed to continue all of these years. Yeah, and so that leads to a really quick follow-up. Uh, Alana posted in the chat and Kevin had kind of quickly responded, but the question was, what's the point of having this meeting? What's the point of protesting if we believe nothing is going to change? And Kevin, you had responded, we are the change. And Mary and Nikima, you kind of alluded to the idea that change is possible. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be difficult, but it is absolutely possible. And I wanted to give you guys a further platform to talk about what a potential way forward is. Kevin, you had jumped in a chat to respond, so I'll turn to you first, and then I'll turn to Nikima and Mary as well. See, you know, the key is people. We're talking about systems, and then we're talking about people, and let's separate the two. That's the part of the system they try to, like, take control over people, and we were people, human beings, before any system were created. So the change is going to come from us as people deciding that this is not the world that we want to live in, and this is not the relationship we want to be into each other as fellow human beings. We're going to have to completely get the system out of our business. As long as we're talking and the system is our mediator, we're going to continue to misunderstand each other. We're going to continue to come up short in these conversations because the system has a self-interest and the self-interest is power. And it's not, it's going to literally go to war before it give up that power. So I don't got no faith in the system, but I have faith in people. That's why I'm here. I have faith that us human beings are who are here, have the ability to say, you know what? That's not the city, that's not the state, that's not the country, that's not the world that we wanna live in. And we're gonna start doing it by how we treat each other and let the system get on board. Yeah, just to piggyback off of what Kevin said, um, as a black person, I cannot sit idly by and be comfortable and complacent because things haven't changed quickly enough. That's not in my DNA, it's in my DNA to stand up and fight and to challenge the system and to be a voice of reason and to present alternative solutions for how to move forward, as well as to hold our elected officials accountable. That is the hallmark of our democracy, participation and demanding what we want to see as the people. So we have not only a right, we have a duty to be out there standing up, protesting, using our voices, using the power of our pen until we see systemic changes within the system and some of these systems even overhauled. Now there have been some changes, it just hasn't happened quickly enough in terms of the system being overhauled, but we've seen a number of people actually moved out of um, elected positions that they've been in um, or who have uh, resigned or stepped aside because of um, community pressure that they have received. We have begun to see some changes to the policies and the protocols within MPD, but again, it's not happen, happening quickly enough. And not to mention, we're going to have 
a, a new crop of officers, um, whether good or bad, um, as a result of public pressure against uh, MPD and calling things out, we made things less comfortable for those hundreds of officers who decided to leave the Minneapolis Police Department. So, you know, don't get confused as we're saying that, you know, this, the, the a conviction in this case is not going to bring George Floyd back and that this is not complete justice, but again, it is a symbol of justice and it does matter to have our courts recognize the humanity of a black man whose life was needlessly taken at the hands of a person who was supposed to protect and serve. In terms of how we move forward, I think we're, we are, one thing that's important for people around the nation to understand about what's happening in Minneapolis is the fact that the killing of George Floyd and our reaction as a community did not happen as a vacuum. We have been in a vacuum. We have been consistently taking to the streets since at least the fall of um, 2014, uh, protesting, demanding justice, shutting things down, going into the halls of power and running for office because we wanna see changes happening within this system. And so that is a big part of why we saw a worldwide explosion when it came time to people taking to the streets and standing in solidarity with us because we're not silent, we're not complacent, we're continuing to persevere in spite of the obstacles and in spite of the fact that many of us are, per are politically persecuted for protesting. There are 646 of us who were arrested in November, kettled on the freeway for over five hours simply for engaging in peaceful protests. And those charges are still pending right now. Um, and so, you know, folks can get involved. You can call the governor, you can call the city attorney uh, to demand justice. And most recently, we rose up to challenge the governor's push for a $35 million fund um, for uh, law enforcement to be reimbursed in the event that there's civil unrest or other emergencies that happen. So we took to social media, we took to the uh, mainstream media, we made our voices heard and right now that bill is dead. We know they're planning security, but the people got involved and we began to push back. And that's what we have to continue to do in order to move forward. And part of that starts with us demanding a conviction, not of one officer, but all four who played a role in the murder of George Floyd. All power to the people for that work of shutting that 30 million some dollars down made me afraid they was finna get the cops 30 more million dollars worth of guns. We don't, what, they already got all the guns and the resource and they finna give them 30 more million dollars and people are homeless. So all power to the people, to y'all sister for doing that work. It was really important. Um, it may surprise people, but um, I'm more optimistic than I've ever been in my entire 31 year career. Um, and that's because after what happened to George Floyd, people did rise up and made their voices heard. That groundwork was laid for us by Nakima, by Kevin, by many other people. Um, but the people in this community need to educate themselves about what their public officials do, what prosecutors do, what the system does that the system doesn't want the community to know um, and demand change. Um, that's what the people can do. That's the power that the people have to say, we do not want a system where 30% uh, of the people in our prisons are black. We do not want a system, by the way, where, let's see, in 2017 in Hennepin County, 53.2% of the people convicted of felonies were black. That is not the system that we want as people in Minneapolis. One thing I've said to the white people actually who say um, they fear for their safety, uh, they wanna know when things are gonna go back to normal. And I have said, they're never gonna go back. To, they should not go back to normal. I happen to live in Armitage neighborhood in Minneapolis. And I remember a time when it was about a month after George Floyd was killed that there had been a hundred people shot um, in our community. If 100 people were shot in my neighborhood in Armitage, it would be declared a public health crisis and we would figure out how to fix it. But because violence happens in our marginalized neighborhoods, um, it's been normalized. 
And so we need to make sure we don't go back to normal because normal wasn't good for so many in our community. We all know um, Minneapolis appears on those lists of the top five uh, places to live in the country for white people, not for black people. And so the people, and I agree with you, Kevin and Nakima, need to rise up and find out what their, their, their elected officials are doing and demand change. Because I think that's the only way we are really going to get the change that we deserve in this community. So I have, a, I, have a, I have a question that's very specific to the upcoming Chauvin trial, but plays into these notions about trauma and accountability, especially as it relates to the distrust, the historic distrust, I think, between the community and the Hennepin County Attorney's Office, uh, and, and maybe prosecutors in general, right? But we've gotten a number of questions from our attendees that have questions about the potential for recharging of the third degree murder charge. And I am curious, Nakima, Mary, if you have thoughts on that potential and maybe the propriety of a third degree murder charge in a case like this. So just to give some context about the third degree murder charge, that's what Derek Chauvin had originally been charged with. And many of us raised concerns about the third degree murder charge because typically that charge is focused on reckless behavior. So if someone, let's say, is God forbid in a movie theater, and they just started shooting randomly at people or if they shot you know, at someone and they hit another person, they could be charged with third degree murder. Uh, and so we didn't believe that that was the highest charge that Chauvin should be charged with or the most appropriate charge. And so ultimately prosecutors decided to charge him with second degree murder and second degree manslaughter. Now in the intervening months since George Floyd was killed, um, uh, Muhammad Noor, a former Minneapolis police officer, the only one that we know of in recent uh, history who has been a cop who has been convicted of killing a civilian while on duty, he was charged with third degree murder because he shot out the window and then he hit a woman who was standing there without really assessing the situation. So that was reckless behavior. But third degree murder typically prefer, um, re re refers to a, having a depraved mind, et cetera. And so in the intervening months, um, Muhammad Noor's attorneys filed an appeal um, claiming that third degree murder was not appropriate, et cetera. But the Minnesota Supreme Court or the Court of Appeals, they upheld that third degree murder charge against Muhammad Noor and his conviction. And so as a result, state prosecutors try to adjust uh, their charges to add third degree murder um, to Chauvin's charge and I believe the other three officers. From my understanding so far, the court has rejected that, um, that notion, but Mary may be able to shed more light onto it. Yeah, um, most um, people in the legal community who looked at this issue thought that um, Noor's conviction on third degree murder was going to be reversed because they didn't think that the law in Minnesota applied to that situation. The Court of Appeals decided, but it was a two to one decision, by the way, and one of the judges dissented and said it didn't apply. Um, unfortunately, the timing was just recently, the Court of Appeals found two to one um, that it did apply to his situation. And so that, after that, the Attorney General's office tried to add that charge. Um, Judge Cahill denied their request to do that. And I obviously haven't spoken to Judge Cahill, but my guess is um, he thinks that the Court of Appeals was wrong. Um, and that if he adds that and if Chauvin is convicted of it, that's going to create an appeal issue because we all think that the Court of Appeals decision is going to go to the Supreme Court. Um, and if they are consistent with the law previously, they're going to reverse what the Court of Appeals said. So it, it that's how I read Cahill's decision not to allow them to add that third degree because he thinks that um, the Court of Appeals was wrong in how it interpreted the Supreme Court law. And it really shouldn't apply. I mean, this was an intentional right. act on the part of Derek Chauvin. He wasn't just randomly putting his knee on passerby's necks. George Floyd was targeted in that situation after uh, Cup Foods called 911. So By I'm the way, oh, sorry, Nakima. Oh, go ahead. 
I was just going to say, as an example, we typically, we don't see third degree murder that often, but when we see it, it's usually when somebody is selling drugs and somebody dies of an overdose. And so that's, that's the idea of it, it wasn't directed at a particular person. So I, I think many of us thought it was misapplied uh, to Officer Knorr, um, who was also charged with second degree murder, intentional murder, um, which, uh, for which he was found not guilty. And I think that that's another reason why people in the community see that there are two different systems. You had a black a Somali cop who clearly overreacted um, by firing a gun out his window. I would say he certainly didn't intend to kill anyone, yet he was charged with intentional second degree murder. Um, and as Nakima said, he's, he's the only police officer who was convicted um, and he happened to be black and it happened to be a white woman uh, who was killed. I, I would like to say for sure, um, I'm gonna lean on the expertise of the attorneys, but I do know like for us, anything violently, we would have to, we'd have been charged with first degree murder first, arguing for third degree murder. It wouldn't have been the other way around. You are right. All the times I've seen third degree murder while I was in prison, it was because someone sold some drugs to someone yep. and they died doing a drug. That I haven't, I ain't seen too many people with third degree murder. Like we would get yep. charged with second degree or first degree and we would have to argue for third degree versus this is an example. Instantly they go in and say, well, this was third degree murder anything to do with us violently using our hands, our bodies, our gun to take the life of someone, they was gonna instantly charge us with intentional murder. Right? Yeah, Kevin, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say you're, you're right. Um, if this was, and this is not a criticism of the attorney general's office, it's an observation of jurors, um, but if it was a public defender client, I believe that person would have been charged with intentional second degree murder. Intent can happen in seconds. And so when you see Chauvin with his knee on Mr. Floyd's neck and his, his pulse, he's lost his pulse and he goes on and on and on, that is certainly intent to cause death. Um, but um, he's been charged with second degree unintentional murder. And as I said, it's, it's not at all a criticism of the attorney general's office. It's just, I think the burden that they probably see in, act in trying to convince a jury here that a police officer who knows he's being recorded, there's a crowd there actually intended to kill someone. And so I think that that's my perception of what why he hasn't been charged there, but you're right, Kevin, if it had been one of uh, a public defender client, um, they would have been seeking, and not the AG because they don't handle, uh, and by the attorney general, I mean, the Hennepin County Attorney's Office would definitely have charged with intentional second degree murder. And as a quick follow-up to that, I know Sarah has a question, but before you jump in with that question, Sarah, we learned, I think, well, there was initial reporting on this last year, but there was a big New York Times story on this, I think, within the past month with respect to the potential of a plea deal involving the third degree murder charge. And, and I am curious to get the reaction, given your comments already from Nakeem and Mary and potentially Kevin, I'm curious to get your reactions as to the, the, the perspective of that being the plea offer, right? And, you know, we've convened this forum to talk about justice but the, the thoughts of whether or not such a resolution to the case would have been just. I, you know, it kind of goes back to what is justice. I think anybody who has been victimized, um, who's suffered harm, doesn't necessarily find a decision, a conclusion, a conviction to be, um, to make them feel better. It's not closure it, because it isn't, it isn't accountability. Most people who are harmed want to make sure that this never happens to somebody else again. Um, and, and so unless we have um, changes, some of which we've talked about, I don't know that, and I, I'm not, I don't pretend to speak for George Floyd's family or, or the community, but I, I think the only way there is accountability here is if we move way beyond a conviction and there is true accountability in the rest of the system. It's, it's not unusual at all for there to be plea negotiations. I would just say some people were really confused about why the federal uh, prosecutors were involved. Um, and if I could just explain quickly that 
I'm sure what they said was, if you plead to the state charge, we won't convene a federal grand jury. We won't go after you federally. And usually federal penalties are much more harsh. Um, but as we all know from that article, uh, William Barr, who was the attorney justice or attorney general at the time, uh, would not agree to that. So there's nothing unusual about it. I think what's unusual about it is it was publicized so close to the trial. Um, where everybody now knows he apparently was willing to plead guilty to a charge. Um, my guess is they, once again, um, it's, I mean, I, I look back to Philando Castile um, and I wonder how is it that the officer in that case wasn't convicted? And I think it goes to jurors have a hard time convicting cops of murder of, of much of anything. There's, there's a bigger hurdle there for some reason. Um, and so that may be why they were willing to, to make a deal to get a sure conviction rather than go to trial where you never know what's gonna happen with jurors. Well, I, just to piggyback off of uh, what Mary's saying, I mean, the reality is that a lot of folks are gonna be looking more closely at that plea deal if the jury in this current case that after is seated, if they do not convict Derek Chauvin. Um, we know that it's very difficult to get a conviction. And a lot of that has to do with people, as we've been saying. Um, the jury in you know the um, case for the officer who killed Philando Castile was an almost all white jury. From my understanding, they had two young black people on the jury, one a young black man and one um, um, a, an immigrant from Africa, and they were outnumbered. You know, I, I would think if I was on a jury like that, there would have been a different decision, or if there had been, um, you know, older, you know, more African American folks, older African American folks, because we were all pretty consistent in terms of realizing that the death of Philando Castile did not have to happen, and that that officer violated Philando's civil rights, he violated the law in killing him. But of course, again, we're in Minnesota. Minnesota's 85% white. Minnesota has a history of looking the other way when it comes to police misconduct and abuse and even police murder. And so it's no wonder that they try to quickly rush a deal through in the hopes of easing some of the tensions in the community and not allowing the levels of civil unrest that we actually experience to actually happen. I mean, we had the second highest um, amount of, of property damage um, in the history of this country in a situation like that, second only to Los Angeles in the aftermath of uh, Rodney King uh, being beaten and those officers being acquitted during their first trial. And so that's part of why they were trying to rush that deal through. Um, but we, all of us are gonna be thinking, you know, we didn't know about the deal at the time, but I think a lot of people are going to be wondering um, whether or not that would have been a better outcome than whatever the jury comes back with. I know that a lot of folks believe it's a slam dunk because of the existence of the bystander video, but we know that videos have meant nothing in terms of officers being held accountable. We saw Eric Garner be choked out over some loose cigarettes and not a single one of those cops uh, was held accountable for what they did. And the list goes on and on to Mir Rice, um, I mean, just on and on and on and on of Black people murdered on video by police, and there is zero accountability. So here, we need to keep our guards up and understand that it is not a slam dunk um, in this case. And if Chauvin is not convicted, I would bet my bottom dollar that the Attorney General's office is not going to continue with the prosecution of those other three cops. Nikima, can I follow up on something you said about the jury? Um, you were referring to the fact that we don't have that many black jurors usually on our panel here. One thing that does concern me um, is that we're, they're doing this trial during COVID. And um, that has a lot of implications. Uh, what you know, for the most part, we continue to do trials in Hennepin County during COVID. And what we had seen, the courts had been sending out a questionnaire to potential jurors, um, giving them the opportunity to opt out if they did not want to serve as a juror during COVID. And what we started seeing was that the demographics of the juries changed a lot. 
um, we were not seeing uh, as many potential black jurors. Um, and that may very well be they were self-selecting out. Um, we know um, COVID uh, has hit our black community particularly hard. Um, and so if, if you are a black juror and you're asked, you know, would you like to come down and be on a jury trial? When, when they actually had, I think they had, the AG had an affidavit from Dr. Michael Osterholm that it's not safe um, to try a case during COVID. And, and so that's certainly reasonable not to wanna be on a jury. And so I have some real concerns that this jury is gonna be even whiter than most of the, the juries that we tend to see. Well, and there's also the economic impacts. You know, mm -hmm. many Black people in the, the in Hennepin County, in the Twin Cities, we can't take off that much work for the little pay that jurors receive. And mm -hmm. often we have childcare and other pressing family needs that have an impact. Uh, so part of it is just the structure of the system that creates unnecessary barriers to people who may have good intentions about serving on a jury and who may want to do so. Mm -hmm. And I'm just going to jump in with a question that um, I'm looking at the at Facebook and the chat and the questions that are coming in. Um, this whole conversation, this whole conversation is really, um, really critical. And it stemmed from a question Andrew initially asked about distrust between community and the county attorney's office. Um, you know, one of the things that's coming through on the chat is what is the um, what, is, what are the things that you might be looking for out of the prosecution of this case? And on the flip side of that, we've heard from, from someone who's a public defender. And Mary, I know you, know you spent your whole career as a public defender. Andrew and I are, have both served as public defenders who have concerns about also the way the, some of the tactics that the prosecution might be using in this case that could set a precedent that are gonna be used then against black indigenous and other people of color going forward because we know that's who ultimately comes into our criminal justice system. So if folks could comment both on what you're watching for in the prosecution of this case and how you think that some of the tactics that are being used might then impact our community moving forward. I, um, as to the distrust, I think that it's a good thing that the Hennepin County Attorney's Office is not, I, my guess is they're not gonna be very involved in this case at all. It will be the Attorney General. And they are responsible for uh, making matters worse. And I'm thinking about the complaint that the Hennepin County Attorney's Office actually filed um, against Derek Chauvin when it was third degree murder. If you ask any public defender, um, none of us had ever seen a complaint like that. It had all of the defenses written in it. Um, I mean, I, it, was, it was unheard of. I, nobody's ever seen a complaint like that. So you might ask yourself, why is the prosecutor's office, and by complaint, I mean the charging document that was completely written by the prosecutors. And in that, um, they outlined their case, but they also added in all of the defenses. Um, which is never done by a prosecutor. And so that made everybody wonder what is going on? Are you really serious about prosecuting this case? Um, it, so I think it's a good thing that it went to the attorney general's office. Uh, one of the things that they did, the Hennepin County Attorney's Office did that concerns me is they cherry picked something from the medical examiner's autopsy. What they said was that Dr. Baker could, did not observe any um, injury consistent with uh, the knee being on um, Mr. Floyd's neck. And people who looked at that thought, what do you mean? Um, they interpreted understandably as um, the knee wasn't on his neck, we all made something up. And that's not what the medical examiner was saying at all. What he said was when he looked, and I'm sorry to be graphic here, looked inside the neck and, and looked for if there was any bruising from the neck, he didn't see that. Um, and that caused a tremendous amount of damage and distrust in the community because people were like, what is that all about? Um, and they, yet they just put, they cherry picked that and put it in the complaint. Um, what I am looking for from the county, or the, excuse me, the attorney general's office, which I think is critical here, I believe um, the defense is going to talk about the drugs that were in Mr. Floyd's system. And I believe they're going to claim that then, that somehow led to his death. 
Um, but what I think the AG's office has to do, which is critically important here, is to be consistent and in pointing out that all, and I believe there were three medical examiners who uh, did an autopsy, all three agreed that it was homicide. Dr. Baker from Hennepin County, uh, and, and all three agreed that the cause of death was the knee in Mr. Floyd's neck. The only difference there is that Baker from Hennepin County said that the knee cut off the blood supply uh, to the brain, and that's what caused his death. The two medical examiners hired by the family said the knee caused his uh, asphyxiation and he couldn't breathe, which led to his death. And so I think the attorney general's office has to do has to really keep that jury on track. And, and to me, it's like, um, you know, saying if they're trying to argue, well, he could have died from that level of fentanyl. Well, he didn't, did he? You know, you could say George Floyd's on the ground. He's got all these drugs. He might have died um, later. If you substituted the knee on the neck for a cop shot him, would you be able to argue that the drugs might have caused his death? In the law, uh, the law says you take your victim as you find them. So it doesn't matter that Mr. Floyd might have been using drugs in terms of cause of death. And so I think that's a critical piece that the AG really has to stay on point and, and make sure that the jurors don't get distracted um, by, by those differences, which are, are very minor. Yeah, I would agree with, um what Mary just said. And I would also add, of course, jury selection is going to be vitally important and making sure that the AG's office is serious in terms of selecting jurors um, and trying to find people who are willing to be fair and objective in terms of uh, looking at the circumstances. From my understanding with one of the questionnaires that was sent out, it asked the prospective jurors, how do they feel about the Black Lives Matter movement and how do they feel about defund the police. So that's going to be interesting in terms of yep. <laughs> um, how our movement and everything else that's happened will play a role in terms of how this case is ultimately viewed and decided. I also think the AG's office, the, the prosecutors, you know, some of them I think are volunteer attorneys who are part of this case as well. They're going to have to focus on humanizing George Floyd, which is, I shouldn't even have to say it. But the fact that the defense is already planning to try to uh, make George Floyd the cause of his own death um, through whatever drugs were in his system, they're going to have to work hard to show that he was a human being. And as Mary said, that that was not the cause of his death. George Floyd would have went on along his day and still been alive had he not encountered Derek Chauvin and those other three um, police officers. And I think that the public is going to have to pay attention and make sure that, that the public doesn't fall for the okie doke and take some of those false and very detrimental narratives that we know the, that the defense attorneys are gonna push as well as the media and not take the bait hook, line and sinker and agree that George Floyd was the cause of his own death. Cause that's what we tend to see happen in these situations, especially with regard to black victims um, in police killing cases, the, the victim is often seen as the perpetrator, even though they're dead, even if they did absolutely nothing wrong. And this case will be no different, unfortunately. I wanted to say, I'm, I'm looking at the juror questionnaire here, and I wanted to tell everybody, you can go on uh, Hennepin County District Court website. They've put, they have a Derek Chauvin place on there. And you can look at all the documents that have been filed, including the, the uh, questionnaire that the jurors were given. And yes, it does ask, um, it asks about blue lives matter and it asks about black lives matter. Yeah, and so I'm gonna turn it over to Kevin to follow up as well. But the I would, what, only thing I would say, if they're calling him anything other than defenseless victim, then it's a problem. That's who brother George was at the moment of his life being taken. He was a defenseless victim, right? Where four armed, trained military officers against a person who didn't have a weapon, who was completely defenseless. So any language that's outside a defenseless victim that has anything to do with his history, any of that, anything other than the defenseless victim, George Floyd, is, you know, is propaganda. Because again, I know 
I've seen charge papers, like Mary said, inside of the charge paper, they're like writing in the defense, right? I've seen charge papers where it's gonna be horrific. It would have been horrific language used to describe that murder, right? It would have been horrific. And I wanna make sure that the language stays on point. And the point is he was a defenseless victim. Anything outside of that is smoke. Just a really quick question before you, you move the conversation that just came in through the Facebook platform is um, whether they whether you might anticipate any motions in limine to exclude um, evidence of uh, any any evidence of drugs or anything else in this case. The motions in limine are actually all on the site and thanks Sarah I see you just posted it there. I I, I don't recall whether they did, but I'm guessing that they did. And and I think even though uh, that will be coming in, I think if the defense lawyers start arguing contrary to what the testimony says, I mean, you're allowed to argue inferences from whatever the testimony is, but if those medical examiners, however many they have testify, are, are clear on what the, you know, this was a homicide, it was caused by the knee to the neck. I think if they start arguing that um, he might have died from drugs, I, I think that that would be an inappropriate argument. And, and I would certainly hope that the judge would shut that down. Um, and so that's what I expect to be the, the testimony that, as I said, all the the documents are on that website. Um, motions and limine are in there, um, as well as memos on third degree murder. So if you're interested in, in looking at those, they're there. Yeah, and my recollection of going through those molims is that they don't discuss the use of drugs. And so I would anticipate much like Mary alluded to that that's going to be um, I'm primarily what the defense is going to be centered around. Uh, but that being said, I want to kind of return back to that question of jury selection. We had gotten another question from our guests uh, with respect to how, how could we possibly pull together a panel of unbiased citizens in this case? And if, if we don't actually anticipate that happening, is there a process by which we can ensure that there is a more just process for jury selection? Um, and I don't know who wants to tackle that particular question first, whether it's Nahima, Kevin, or Mary, but I will turn it over to you three and basically ask you, is there a way to do jury selection better, especially in a situation where we have a, an incredibly high profile case here, and it seems to be the consensus that we can anticipate a whiter than normal jury in this case? I think we should have waited. Oh, sorry, Kevin, go ahead. Go ahead. No, what I would say is I got, you know, friends and loved ones who's in Minnesota Correctional Facilities right now with cases that made me think I read their cases like, who was the jury that convicted these people? What 12 Minnesotans did they find to say guilty to this? So I don't know, I'm gonna be, a, be real with you. I don't know, my, I don't know. My faith in, you know, what that may look like. I've just seen horrific things happen in places where you would say, hey, we've done a lot of work. No way that can happen. And I've seen mm -hmm. it happen right there. So. Man, I don't know. I don't trust these good old Minnesotans. I'm going to be real with you. Um, I, I was going to say they're doing uh, uh, jury selection one by one. Um, and I actually wish they weren't trying it during COVID um, because that would at least give us a better opportunity of getting a more diverse jury. I think one of the things that people don't understand is you don't actually have a right to jurors that know nothing about your case. Um, you have a right to theoretically have jurors that whatever opinions they might have, they can set aside. And so that leaves a lot of discretion within the trial judge. Um, because I know that both sides will be arguing that people cannot set aside their, their um, opinions and it will be ultimately up to the judge to decide uh, whether to let those jurors go or not. Um, so I, I think that that's going to be critical. Um, but they are, and another thing I wanted to say actually is that they're being sequestered, um, which is very unusual uh, for jurors, juries in Hennepin County, but they are being sequestered. And what that means is they're going to be kept together after closing arguments and instructions until they come back with a jury. That can be extremely 
difficult. You got to stay in a hotel with people you don't know. Usually they take your phone away and you got to stay there until you come back with a decision. There is a possibility, according to the judge's order, that he may sequester them throughout the trial if people try to contact them. They're also going to be anonymous. They're going to be assigned numbers. Um, so you know, one kind of wonders what it would be like to be a juror on this case, given all of those precautions, which we normally don't have in cases here in Hennepin County. Nikki, Nikki, did you have anything that you wanted to add on that? No, I don't want to add anything. I think Mary and Kevin covered it. And so I'm going to take a quick time check. My watch says 516. Uh, my plan was to have our conversation wrapped up by about 5.20 so that we could get into closing remarks and allow everyone to kind of go and have dinner. Um, that being said, I'm going to try and pick a, a final question here that we can talk about. Uh, and I, I, I will apologize to everyone and the questions that I didn't get to because there are a lot of them. Um, so but the, kind of question, the question I want to get at kind of plays into the question of justice. It plays into the question of accountability and trust in historical trauma. And it's been touched on, but not specifically answered quite yet. And we got a question with respect to, does, the, does there seem to be more hope in the community that the, the Attorney General's office has effectively taken over this case? And if so, what does that mean for the Hennepin County Attorney's Office going forward as the instrument of justice in Hennepin County? Uh, and Nikki, it looks like you want to jump in. Yeah. Please jump the in. Hennepin okay. County Attorney's Office has never been an instrument of justice. So anyone who thinks that, please get that out of your mind. It is not true. It is not accurate. We have been trying to recall Mike Freeman and <laughs> push for a different Hennepin County attorney that actually does care about justice. He has been a huge part of the problem and a big part of the reason why uh, cops have been able to kill with impunity. And, you know, unfortunately, what's happening with the Hennepin County Attorney's Office is not unusual to the extent that prosecutors around the country, as well as across the state of Minnesota, typically fail to charge killer cops because of the close relationship that their office holds with law enforcement agencies. They rely on um, law enforcement agencies to do their job and to help funnel cases into the system for them to prosecute and they don't wanna face retaliation. They also don't wanna face the political pushback that police federations are able to bring to the table because they are typically a powerful force within political systems that can help silence elected officials or get them to do what they want them to do. So I think that those things are important in terms of thinking about the Hennepin County Attorney's Office. Um, you know, it's hard to say in terms of having more faith with regard to the AG's office based on my own personal experience. I will say I'm glad it's out of the hands of the Hennepin County attorney. Um, I went on record along with many others when the AG's office actually kept the Hennepin County attorney on the case initially. We said absolutely not. He has shown that he is not competent, that he is not willing to charge non-Black killer cops. And so he does not need to touch this case with a 10-foot pole. Thankfully, Judge Cahill removed him um, from the case and so far he hasn't been put back on the case. But what we were requesting was not the AG, we were requesting an independent special prosecutor to oversee this case. And um, you know, under Minnesota law, the governor had the authority to appoint the AG who could have then appointed a special prosecutor but who chose not to do so uh, to oversee this case. So I have more faith than if Mike Freeman in the county attorney's office was overseeing it, but I have very limited faith in the system's ability to deliver justice to black victims of police violence. I don't wanna ditto that. Yeah, faith is not the word. I would say people are just, it's something new. So what we're doing, history will remember this moment and we are gonna see if this new thing works. It's just something different. People were just so tired of like the Hennepin. We knew what we were gonna get with that. So any news of, okay, something different, here it is, us good old salt of the earth folks, giving the system a shot again, saying, okay, we're gonna try this thing. So we're gonna see um, if our faith is gonna be rewarded or not, but we don't know. Um, this is an example of holding our elected officials accountable. Um, Mike Freeman's term is up in two years. Um, 
I remember, so many of you may not know this, but the Hennepin County Attorney's Office has a data dashboard, which has race statistics on it. And I recall the county attorney at one point giving a presentation to the county board and saying, yes, there are racial disparities, but that's not our fault. That's because of who the cops bring us. And that's, we need something different. Um, we need somebody who will stand up and say, I need to work with the police. I need to look at my own office and figure out what we can do to reduce racial disparities. We need somebody who's transparent um, with the community, who will listen to the community, all of the community. And so this is a, one of those examples where people on this call and um, others can educate themselves about the power a prosecutor actually has. I would say, and many people say, the prosecutor is actually the most powerful person in the system. And so people need to understand what role they play and the power and discretion that they have. And they need to educate themselves um, for, for the election that's coming up because I don't see um, the Hennepin County Attorney's Office regaining anybody's trust given everything that's happened. And certainly it, this trial um, may be the beginning of accountability, but the, as I've said before, there needs to be systems change and we need to have people in positions, leading organizations like the Hennepin County Attorney's Office that are willing to hold themselves accountable and look at change. And real quick, because I think this last question is going to segue very nicely into Sarah wrapping us up. But I think it's fairly obvious that a lot of us are going to be watching the trial very closely, right? And we've gotten questions, and I think it's a fair question to ask, but what is it that Minnesota residents, Hennepin County residents, the folks who are interested in this process, what can we do during the course of the trial to argue for change, to ask for change, to demand change, to demand accountability? Um, are there specific things that people should be doing or looking to do, especially as the trial is going on? Uh, and I'll let, I'll let Kevin, Nakeem, and Mira, I'll let you guys get to this. And then Sarah, I'm gonna throw it right to you as soon as they're done with their response. If, if your goal ain't all power to the people, I ask you to stay out the way, right? There was a lot of people in the way. So any of our white allies, if you're my allies, maybe the best thing you can do right now is just stay out of the way, please. And so just <laughs> following up on that, I'm asking people to show up. So like Kevin said, if you're not there in the right spirit and you're in the way, then you're going to waste our time and energy. Um, not to mention you might impede progress. But if you are serious about standing up for justice, when we issue calls to action, when we have demonstrations, they'll be peaceful, you know, to the extent that we can control. Um, we ask people to show up. We ask you to put your bodies on the line, just like we do. Write op-eds, notify your friends about what's really going on and use your social media platforms as well. And if you're a person of faith, definitely pray for justice to be served in this case or at least a semblance of justice. I would say watch it. Um, we have a unique opportunity here. Trials have not been televised ever. What you've only seen in the media from here is sensationalistic, you know, there's a sentencing or something like that. But this is a unique opportunity for, for people who live here to actually watch a process, if you have the time, um, to watch the process and see what actually happens. Uh, Mary, Kevin, Nikima, thank you all. It's 524 by my watch. Um, Sarah, I'm gonna turn it over to you for a few closing remarks, for comments. Um, and if this is the last time I speak on camera, thank you all for being here. This has been fantastic. Appreciate you too, thank Andrew. You. Thank you. Thank you all so much um, for joining us for this critical conversation. There were so many questions that were asked and there was so much audience engagement that we could not get to today, but please know that this conversation is just the start for us. Today's forum is part of our work focused on being responsive to community legal needs, and we will be hosting a number of events and putting out a lot of critical resources to support community over the coming months. You can see a couple of these events on your screen. We have a Know Your Rights training coming up on Friday, March 5th with our attorneys for folks who want to be out and show up in the way that Nakima and Kevin are asking um, and want to be able to know what your rights are in that space. Join us for that. We are going to hold an Ask an Attorney lunch session on Wednesday, March, Wednesday, March 10th from noon to 1 uh, Central Time. And then we will be holding part two and likely additional parts to this conversation.
conversation moving forward. You can also stay on top of what we're doing by checking out our website or our social media, and you could support these efforts by donating to support this work. We really hope that you'll stay connected with us as we move forward to pursue our community's bold and compelling vision for achieving justice. And we're deeply grateful to all of you for spending this time with us today. Thank you very much.